the table is where life happens. It's where imagination runs wild. Where lessons are learned. And wonders are built. The table is where time can stop. Where wounds are comforted. And freedom begins. It's where we find peace. And we laugh till it hurts. The table is where we gather with family, new and old, to share stories, to nourish our bodies, to enrich our souls. The table is where we give thanks and where we remember what great gifts we have been given. I think most of us have a table in our homes, a place that we meet, that we connect, that we eat. The table is actually very special in most of our homes. It's the place where our kids do homework. It's the place where you break bread one with another. Maybe it's the place where you put your bills on the table. You say, God, help me get through this. The table. The table is something significant. In fact, there's been many arguments at the table. But there's been many times of forgiveness at the table as well. It's where you've looked at the last piece of chicken and wondered if you could have it. At the table is where we come together. It's where life happens. It's one of the most intimate places in our homes. And I would nearly challenge us with this thought that maybe even just as powerful as your family altar is a table. Because a table is often where you meet with God. It's where you laugh often. It's where you chuckle one with another. It's where you sometimes drink soda and it comes out your nose at the table. If you have kids, you've probably seen that. It's where we laugh. It's where we're fed. And it's where we give thanks. At the table. In fact, biblical passages illuminate the importance of the table. In Exodus, it describes when the tabernacle was being built in the wilderness. God gives specific instructions to the priests of, of how to build the table. And the sanctuary that was in the wilderness, you know, it had its outer court and its inner court. And it went from one distant stage of relationship to another. And right before the entrance of the Holy of Holies was the table of the presence. And on there was often 12 loaves of bread that every Sabbath they used to change the loaves. And see, can I tell you, there's something special about the table. There's something significant that God wants us to know that life happens at the table. And so the table of presence, uh, uh, it was made out of the special type of wood. It had specific dimensions. And, and it was where they offered their sacrifices before they entered into God's presence, his glory. You first have to stop at the table and give thanks. Now, isn't that a lesson for us today that before we enter into God's glory, we first have to stop and give thanks. 
In just a few days, many of us here will be gathering together with family. And you'll laugh and you'll chuckle and you'll eat. In fact, yesterday I ran extra miles just so I could make space for what I'm going to eat at the table. But that's what Thanksgiving is. It's, it's not just a cultural holiday. But I believe that for the people of God, it's something even more special. It's the precursor to the God's glory. Because the priests were the only ones that could enter into the Holy of Holies, which was the inner court. And in order for them to go in, they first had to stop by the table of presence and eat from the bread of presence. There's something significant so even about the bread. In Jewish culture, when they made bread, they would refer to it as unleavened bread. They didn't add anything to it. It was something that they knew throughout their time that they walked on this earth. While they were in the wilderness, bread fell from what? From heaven. And they called it manna. As they celebrated the Passover, they gathered together and they would often break bread one with another and gave thanks at the table. What happens at your table? Who, who is seated at your table? What are the conversations that you encounter at your table? Do you know the most intimate thing that you can do for one another is to invite them to your home and to eat with you? It's the most intimate type of human connection amongst friends is to say, come over and eat with me. It's not about let's go out to eat at a restaurant, which can be nice. But the most intimate thing is to say, come and dine taste what I've cooked. Come eat with me. Who's sitting at your table? Can you open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 25? I believe God wants to meet us at the table. I believe that God wants his glory to be invited to dine with us, our families, our hopes, and our dreams. And this was the instructions starting from verse 23 that was given. I'm going to ask you to stand with me if you can. Before I read, can you just whisper this to someone nearby? And can you tell them God wants to encounter you at the table? Can you find someone else that looks hungry? Someone else that looks like they need a hearty meal. And can you tell them that God wants to encounter you? at the table I'm telling you there's something special at the table see there's a covenant that happens when you dine and it's no wonder why David says he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies in other words there's an encounter that God wants to have with you which is why he prepares a table not for everybody but for his children. I'm going to read this morning from the NIV version. So just follow me as I read. And the instructions were given as such. It says, make a table of acacia wood, two cubits long, a cubit wide, 
and a cubit and a half high. He said, overlay it with pure gold and make a gold molding around it. Can you imagine? This was an expensive table. Also make around it a rim of handbreadth wide and put a gold molding on the rim. Make four gold rings for the table and fasten them to the four corners where the four legs are. The rings are to be close to the rim to hold the poles used in carrying the table. To make the poles of acacia wood, overlay them with gold and carry the table with them. And make its plates and dishes of pure gold as well as its pitchers and bowls for the pouring out of offerings. Put the bread of the presence on this table to be before me at well, sometimes. At all times. Put the bread of the presence on this table to be before me at all times. Father, as we break bread as this word, I pray, Father God, that our hearts will be challenged to meet you at the table. Father God, we understand that in order to enter into the inner court, into the holy of holies, we must first stop by the table of your presence and meet with you and give thanks for you. Father, we pray and we say amen. You may be seated. And can you imagine that the people of Israel were in the wilderness and there were these instructions to make a tabernacle out of this fine cloth. And not only were they given instructions to make a tabernacle, but they created these, these levels, and I call these levels of intimacy. And there's the outer court, which... Essentially, anyone could go. But as you move closer to the Holy of Holies, there were requirements on the lives of those that would dare step further. In fact, the most inner and most intimate place was called the Holy of Holies. It was only the priests that could enter into that room, into that veiled area, and they had to be right. Because in order to really receive God's glory, you, you've got to be right, friends. You, you can't just be any way you want to. And I understand that we're in the third dispensation of grace. But can I tell you, holiness has not changed just because Jesus arrived. In fact, he's the manifestation of what it means to be holy. And God is inviting us to move deeper into the level with him, to intimacy, and to the place where his presence and his glory is. I believe that this is something that God has been impressing upon us even these last few weeks. There's been a, a move of God that's, that's something special. And he's talking to us today, the church. And as I was studying, I was wondering, what an expensive table to be in a desert, like a wilderness, not a fancy temple built with bricks, but the temple was actually made of just fabric and wood. Kind of makes me think about the tents we had. And maybe we just got a little taste of how God's glory doesn't have to be confined to a building. But it can be felt out even in the middle of a street. These specific instructions were given and they made this table 
out of acacia, this, this expensive wood, and they overlaid it with gold. I mean, the same gold that they brought from Egypt. They used it, and they made this beautiful table. It's called the table of presence. The word presence is so powerful even in itself. I believe that if we ask for God's presence, we're expecting something to happen. That if your life is inviting, say, God, I need your presence here. You're not just asking for a pat on your back. You want his full grace and glory to be available to you. Is, is there anyone here that wants God's presence in every aspect of your life? Are you willing to step a little further? Because I can't get his presence by hanging out in the outer court and, and in other words, doing what everyone else does. You know, I can't even get there by just doing a little bit more than everybody else. But if it, it requires us to go deeper, to be more faithful, to be more loving, to ask for God's holiness. And if you ask young people the question of, do any of you want to be holy? I challenge you to ask them that this week. Their response is going to be one of two things. One, they will either have no idea what holiness means. Or they'll have no example for them to follow. We got to get it right. I believe that the call is there and God wants us to get into this place of intimacy. And it's interesting the position because the table was placed at the northern side of that inner court and right beyond that was the veil, the veil that the only the priests was able to go into. So that means they had to pass by the table of presence which had the bread of presence on it before they could go in. And, and can I tell you, God doesn't need your bread. He doesn't need your money. But what he is asking for is your thanks, for your worship, for your praise. Because if God gets your praise, then He'll get the bread. He'll get the money. He'll get everything else. If you first start by giving him your true worship and praise, then everything else is easy. Sometimes we try to give beyond our worship, and we will never receive the blessing that God intended because it's coming from our pocket, not from our heart. But God is calling for a church. That has gratitude. That is thankful in all things, in all ways. Now fast forward to, to the Gospels. Just turn with me to the book of Mark. Mark chapter 14, I believe. I read from verse 12, and we find Jesus now here, and he's at a different table, but there's a thread of connection between the table that we find in the wilderness, in the temple, and the table that we see here, and the table that David sings about, there's this there's this odd yet powerful connection. And it says on the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, 
I'm reading from verse 12. When it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciple asked him, where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, telling them, go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house, he enters, that the teacher ask, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large room upstairs, furnished. Underline that. Furnished. He prepares the table before me, furnished. Like it's already ready for the people of God. It's already there. He's already prepared the furnishings. But we are to prepare the bread. All the worship. Verse 16, the disciples left and went into the city and found things just as Jesus had told them. And so they prepared the what? The Passover. They prepared the bread. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table eating, he said, truly I tell you, one of you here will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, Surely you don't mean me, not me, Jesus. It is one of the twelve, he replied, one who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. We all know this part of Jesus' journey. It was the last hours that he was alive on earth. And as he's eating... And the table is spread and the room is furnished. He speaks and he says, one of you here will betray me. But the table that they were sitting at, God prepared that table. He prepared the table before me in the what? Presence of my enemies. I used to think that that scripture always meant that God is blessing you in the presence of your enemies. But at the table, there isn't always blessings. There are sometimes some heated arguments that happen at the table. There's sometimes some painful documents that are signed at the table. But it's God that prepares a table before you. Even in the presence of your enemies. Judas was there. And Jesus says to the disciples, his friends, one of you will betray me. And he even goes as far to say the one who dips with me. And, and once again, it's, I don't believe that he was saying the one who just did it at the same time with me, but he was talking about proximity. The one who is close enough to dip in the same bowl as me is the one who will betray me. Can I tell you something? You may not like this one. But you need some enemies in your boat. Or you need some enemies at your table. Not everyone is going to be your fan or your warrior. You need some antagonizers in your life. You need someone that will make you uncomfortable at times. And it really sounds like, does God really want this? Sometimes you need someone who will stab you in your back.
And why would you want that? Because the understanding is that in order for me to get to where God has for me, I got to have some enemies. In order for me to fulfill my purpose and Jesus, this is what he's saying. In order for me to save the world, somebody's got to betray me. Somebody's got to hurt me. Somebody who's close enough and sitting in the intimate space of my table will hurt me. Will come to me in the night and kiss me with a kiss of betrayal. But you're going to need that sometimes. Because you can't get to where God needs you to go until you've had some hurts and had some fights and had some battles and had some tears and have some people that have talked about you. Some people that you love, that you've raised, that you've been there for and they've turned their back. Yes! But God still prepares a table before you. No, it wasn't the enemy. It wasn't his doing. The difficulty in your life, don't give him the credit for that. It's God preparing a table before you, even while your presence, while your enemies are present. But then after the disciples got up, Jesus stood up. In verse 22, said he gave thanks. And he broke the bread. He said, this is my, my body. Before he entered into the presence of God, he first stood up and he gave thanks. Just the same way as in the temple in the wilderness. Before you get into the presence of God, there was the table there with bread that you would go to and first to give thanks. So is it possible that in order for you to get to where God plans for you, You've got to be broken. You've got to be embarrassed. You've got to be betrayed. Has anyone ever received betrayal before? Anyone felt like anyone has turned their back on you in the time of need? And, and, and oftentimes, uh, the ones that have done it is the ones that you have given everything for. And they've turned your back and you've gotten upset. But can I tell you, God has prepared a table for you in the presence of your enemies. I remember as a younger kid around Thanksgiving when it was just a family there then I got to sit at the big people's table. But when there was a lot of people there, they started to separate by age group. Does anyone know about the kitty table? There sometimes is a kitty table that is full of rambunctious children that are playing and throwing food. And I think it happened with my brother, Jeremy, that he wasn't that young. I'm not sure if this was you or one of the other siblings, but he wasn't that young, but they told him to go sit with the kids. <laughs> go, sit with the, go sit at the kiddie table. You know how that feels? And you feel like you feel like you just got punked. You know, you just, how are you going to put me at the kitty table? One of the stories that I love in the Gospels is about the, the Kenyanite woman who comes and 
that Jesus and his disciples had taken a much needed rest and he wants to pour into them and she comes and she finds them and she's calling out to Jesus from outside the house and, and, and he acts like he doesn't hear. Right. And the disciples go down, they inquire what's happening and she, you know, and pretty much they, they come back up and, and, and this woman is asking for healing for her daughter who's bound with spirits and asking Jesus to leave everything and come where she is. And, and, and the exchange almost seems sort of rude because Jesus says, well, I got to take care of my people first. In other words, understanding what was going on, she was like, well, why would I take this good stuff and give it to the Gentiles? Now, she wasn't offended by it because there was something that she understood. She said that it even gave a, a he told her a story about puppies, inside puppies, like a house puppy and, and how they're at the dinner table and and the house puppy is pretty much just running around the, the table looking for something to eat. And, and he says, well, why would we give this good food to the, to the dog? And she responds and says, well, even, even the crumbs that fall from the master's table are good enough for me. Friends, if you just even have a seat at the table, it may not be the most important seat. It may be the seat that may seem furthest away, but if you're sitting at the table that he set for you, then give thanks. Even if someone has betrayed you, can I tell you this season of Thanksgiving, don't just be thankful for the things that bring you joy. But can you be thankful for the things that still bring you pain? For the memories that still grip you, the memories, the people that you haven't still forgiven, can you forgive them and give thanks even for the pain that they've caused you? Don't thank them for the pain, but thank them for the glory because out of pain comes glory. Out of Jesus' death has come life. And out of us experiencing this in our lives, We get to sit at the table. Can you just take a few moments and right now? Can you just give thanks for some of the difficult situations in your life? Come on, right now. This seems weird, but yes. Give thanks for some of the difficult people that have pushed you out of your place of average, pushed you out of your place of impotence, that has pushed you in a place where you sought the Lord and prayed more. Can you give God thanks for setting the table? Because it wasn't the enemy all the time. A lot of the times it was God positioning you to where you needed to be. Can we take a moment just to give thanks? Thank you, God, for the person that betrayed me and turned their back on me. Because of that, I'm now closer to you. Could somebody just think about for a moment that what God has done and is doing in your life is purposeful and he's preparing it for you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for that job that I didn't get. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for that disappointment. Thank you, Lord. God, it, it, it put me on the right track. Thank you for the friend that turned their back on me, God, because now I rely more upon you ever than I've ever done in my life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
why do we have to go through this? And God's answer, so that you can experience my glory. Because if you can't give thanks in the middle of a storm, then you don't deserve my glory to be available to you in the middle of the calm. But it's only those that endure to the end. It's only those that, per, uh, that, that persevere, that move through life with a spirit of thankfulness. They will experience my glory in ways that no one else ever has. If you want to experience his glory like that, then what you start need to do even more than ever before to give thanks even for the people that are closest to you. The people at your table. Everybody wants a giant. Everyone wants a beloved. Everybody wants a Peter who's willing to fight for you. Cut off somebody's ear for you. Everybody wants a Peter. But how many wants a Judas? See, Peter didn't get Jesus on the cross. But Judas did. John didn't position our Savior to be the, risen, the resurrected Messiah. Judas did. That God used even betrayal to pull out purpose, possibility, and power. <laughs> I think some of you know what I'm talking about. You've gone through some stuff. Is there anyone here that's gone through some stuff? Can you just raise your hand? Just let me know that I'm not the only one, that you've been through some stuff. And maybe you're still going through some stuff. But God, I'm thankful. Because after he said the words, somebody will betray me, he stood up, he broke bread, and he gave thanks. And then he says, as oft as you do this, do this in remembrance of To get to the inner court, to get into the Holy of Holies, you've got to pass the table of his presence. Amen. Somebody just bless the Lord. God, I don't want to be betrayed. God, I don't want to be lied on. I don't want to be ridiculed, spit at, embarrassed. At. God, I don't want that. But it's necessary. Can someone just praise God for that? There's someone here this morning, and you need God to do something like a shift in your perspective of even the, the way how you're dealing with pain and betrayal and anguish. Maybe you're having a hard time forgiving someone because you're pointing the finger at them, not realizing God just set you up to be blessed by them. That's you this morning. You just want to just want us to join with you in prayer. Would you mind raising your hand? I know there's someone yeah, just having a difficult time just getting over some stuff and 
if that's you this morning, just raise your hand real high. Yeah. See those hands. See those hands. See those hands. I'm going to ask you to do another bold step. If you raise your hand, would you mind just joining at the altar? This won't be, it's not to put your business out there. But we just want to surround you with the love and the patience that you are going to need to overcome this. God wants you to learn how to give thanks even in the middle of pain, tragedy. Because that's how you enter into his presence. It's not just by reading the word, it's by worship. You know what worship is? Worship is just another way or another word to saying, God, I thank you. You will never experience his glory until you learn how to give thanks through your pain. You will never experience his fullness. And there's some things that you're going to have to leave at the altar. There's some things you're going to have to let go. There's some people you're going to have to release Sing the song. Thank you, Lord. 